I'm Rob Kent, and uh, it's Nelly Christmas, hence tinsel. <laughs> Rolf, uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here to your studio to talk. It's uh, you're such a one of my favorite composers, so it's great to dig into you. your process for a little bit. So I'd love to kind of start off about just uh, kind of your background and intro into how you got into music, and at what point in your life did you decide to focus that as a career into kind of film, TV, composing? Uh, when I was 12. 12? No, yeah. this is very I thought on. that's the right, that's the right career to have. <laughs> or you, did you grow up in a musical household? Uh, no, but uh, the um, quite the opposite. But at the age of twelve, I was writing a fair bit of music, um, and at the age of twelve, I realised that film music comes with immediate associations because yeah. you've uh, seen the film. So yeah. that's a rare treat for a, a composer to have music that aut is automatically associated with something. So. Right. I thought film music, that's the way to go. Did you have any like favorite composers growing up that kind of like pulled you into it? Or did you, what, what, what kind of, what did you discover that kind of like, aha, that's what I want? I, well, I, you know, at the time you couldn't, you didn't have VHS or anything. So you yeah. couldn't own anything from, other than music from a film right. that was out, that was new or out. So, um, so that was the one thing that you could take home and listen to and it transport you back to the uh, the environment of the film. Oh, I never even thought about that. Yeah, there was no home video. I mean, home video wasn't a whole thing. You just had the vinyls, right? That was... That's it. That was, uh, yeah, <laughs> when I grew up, there was no, uh, there was nothing else. In fact, the whole idea of video seemed amazing to me that you could actually have images <laughs> repeated, but they didn't exist uh, anyway at that time. Yeah. No. So when did you decide to... I guess, because you're from England, mm -hmm. uh, when did you decide to move to... Uh, oh, when I was hired to come here, that's basically it. What, what were you hired for? Oh, just some small project, but the... Um, uh, but, you know, I didn't come here without a job. I didn't come to Hollywood looking so for you didn't work. Come, yeah, you didn't come here with, like, uh, dreams in my pocket. <laughs> no, I had, a, I had a project, and, um, and then it just kept on, you know, the momentum here was so much greater than... Uh, the momentum for me at the time in London that right. it was just a natural thing to do that you know there was more work and there was more work and so so and how old were you when that happened 27 28 oh wow so you haven't gone back at all just stayed here no I go back a lot I know you go back but like you're living here and your career focus here <laughs> and I'm sure you've gone back um so early on some of the first things in your filmography which I thought was very interesting which are if we hopefully we were allowed we want to talk about it are these the movies the inside out movies that mm -hmm. are on your so they're soft core kind of playboy right yeah I wouldn't even call them soft core I mean they're not really uh they're just tales of the unexpected they often have a little bit of nudity in them but yeah. uh, but not all of them do and um yeah that's that's was a an early thing that's how I met Alexander yeah. Payne Richard <laughs> Shepard <laughs> You Bernard guys. Rose, uh, <laughs> Nigel Dick, a whole bunch of directors. All the directors you kind of focused and created collaborations with. You guys all did the, the, in these inside. Quite a movies. few. You know, Wally Pfister used to shoot that. And yeah. Wally Pfister, you know, became Chris Nolan's go-to guy. Yeah, that's yeah. so amazing. So when you first were working with these directors, I mean, at the time you didn't know you were going to have kind of a budding, or did you know? Did you feel connections to, to these guys that were like, okay, we... Or did yeah, you, I mean, it's... it's you know, I... I I actually you've made me realize that I mean I know that I only seem to work with people who seem to be uh friends people yeah. who are either going to be friends or already are ones and um and that's that just seems to be the way but of course when doing all those films all those short films with a whole load of different uh early you know directors early in their careers yeah um and the ones that uh, still work with me are the ones that became friends. Right. So um, maybe I don't. I don't know if that's how it all joins together. I, it just seems like a. Why would you work with someone you don't enjoy being around? And and yeah. and you have to be so vulnerable in order to show new ideas, creative ideas, and and you have to be so vulnerable in front of people that you you really feel like you should trust them. I mean, I think there's a reason that. The, those kinds of relationships, when they, those relationships aren't there, where there isn't trust between mm. uh, between director and composer, the music's pretty average. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Um, so w what did you, I guess, what were the first things that you kind of learned about the industry when you started working here and kind of what were the first lessons that were maybe hard lessons to learn that you wish you've known? Well, the, the, I'd know, ever, in Britain, a handshake deal had been all you ever needed. Hmm. You trusted a handshake deal. Uh, coming to Hollywood, I was in 
quite early on screwed over by an English producer. Really? <laughs> and so it wasn't. It's not. It's not that Americans were bad. It was that Hollywood, Hollywood was bad. is um, <laughs> somewhere where if you don't have it in ink, you don't have it at all. Yeah. And no matter what someone says about, don't worry, we'll take care of you. Mm, probably not. <laughs> um, so let's focus on yeah some of the um, the directors that you worked with that you started up your career working with, and Alexander Payne being a big one. You have Downsizing coming up uh, coming out this this month. Um, so talk about working with Alexander. Um, how has that relationship evolved from doing Inside Out and now all the way now to downsizing? How, has it? Is it almost like a, a marriage? Do you have a shorthand? I mean, is it? It's nothing like a marriage. There's absolutely there's a lot of things that aren't that don't exist in our relationship, <laughs> which uh, I would imagine exists in uh, most people's marriages. Um, uh, we have a very good rapport. I yeah. mean, that's, you know, rapport is very much what my, you know, relationships with all directors is based on. And um, right. so uh, that doesn't mean it's the same on every film. We have very different approach. You know, we have very different kinds of discussions mm -hmm. on different films. And, um, and I think there's also very different sets of expectations about what, you know, it was funny. I remember on About Schmidt, Alexander saying, you know, this is not, you, I, I realize this is, you know, it's not normal for you to be emotional, but this needs to be emotional music. And I'm going, what are you talking about? I'm emotional in most films, just not yours. And, um, but I've had the same, I've had the same. I remember talking to Jason Reitman and him saying, yeah. you know, um, uh, you don't normally do big sounding sweeping scores, do you? And I go, quite often i do yeah just that's not what <laughs> not you want you. but i but for other people absolutely <laughs> so um uh but yeah so the discussions with that it depends on the film I mean, yeah, has it know. gotten easier because you know him better or is it harder when you know him better because it's harder to find something new that you haven't done before it's not it's not easier but the um but there's a real comfort in the amount of trust and also, he gives a very good canvas to do mm. music on. I mean, he really values music. He values melody. Yeah. And he wants it. He wants to hear it. He wants me to experiment and explore it. And um, so we do. It, it, it's, it's much more experimental with Alexander because I don't know what he's going to respond to. And mm -hmm. he wants to hear a lot of things before he makes his, his decisions. But, um, uh, but he really wants music to play a huge role yeah and uh, which is not normal i mean most directors appreciate music they know they can't live without it but they don't necessarily want it to sort of take you know grab the attention or take over in the way that alexander sometimes desires yeah and um so that's that's great fun to do yeah absolutely so for downsizing um when you guys approach this project it's such a high kind of concept level idea um but I mean, ultimately, it's about the characters and everything. But what was kind of the approach? Did, did the did the plot lend itself to doing some unique in instrumentation or approach? Alexander wanted beautiful classical music, mm. which in the end seemed to turn into what I think of as a Kubrickian approach, which mm. is you know you know when I, when I think of two thousand and one, of yeah. course, it's there. There is no original score in there. It's entirely right. found music and. Um, and there's something about that relationship between something futuristic and something uh, very rooted in the past and very rooted in humanity and, and humanity, yeah. you know, human creativity and juxtaposing the two. So in 2001, it was sort of space things. In this, there are, you know, there's, there's technology for shrinking people and uh, whatever the rationale behind it, the beautiful classical music and it was what he asked for and so I tried writing things which felt entirely like they belonged to themselves mm. and that was too much so I had to dial it a little bit away from that and a bit more towards movie score but um, but still I think you'll find if you listen to the music on its own that it has uh, and this is really what I discovered was in asking for something that felt like beautiful classical music, what he was asking for was something that had a really strong sense of its own center. Yeah. And a lot of times in movies, uh, there, there is no center. You, you are, it, if it's not with the film, it's kind of boring. 
right. and uh, doesn't really know what it is. It knows what it is because it's contributing something which isn't in the film already. Right. Whereas this was that music should feel complete in itself right, right. and juxtapose against the, the film and the, with the image in an interesting way. So that's kind of what ended up happening. But um, so it's not about unique instrumentation and uh, or uh, weird ethnic instruments. It's very much about trying to embody classical music. And so, you know, I borrow, you know, I, I have this sort of sati sensibility in one moment and Hungarian waltzes in another and doing this sort of Verdi like opera, operatic stuff, but it's in Norwegian, of course, because <laughs> why not? Um, and so those things were just explorations which yeah. seem to do interesting things. Even the main theme, the uh, um, the downsizing theme, um, feels period, it feels like it's from some other era to some degree. Wow, that's interesting, yeah, because I you, because you know, classical music. It's it's meant to stand on its own. It's not meant written for pictures. That's why it's that's just an interesting approach. Never thought of it. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, when you watch two thousand one, it's I don't know when I watch two thousand one, the music doesn't feel like yeah, it doesn't to me. It doesn't feel like it's written, meant for that picture, but for some, it does something with the image. Right. Yeah. Very interesting way. But if you you know you think there aren't many composers who who write with the sense of their own center. I think you know Morricone very much mm. so, or at least frequently. Um, Certainly, things like the mission, you listen to it on its own and you just go, well, no need for mute, for an image here. This, right. it, it, it has such a sense of well, itself. Well, he sometimes, I mean, most, uh, he'll write music before the picture or something. I mean, at least with Leone, he did okay. those spaghetti westerns. He wrote those scores and gave it to Leone and then he shot the picture right. to those. Have you ever have you ever done written music before the picture was oh, written? Occasionally, but not not very often. But uh, sometimes, sure. And, um, with Alexander or with other directors? Uh at least not with Alexander, um, certainly with Jason Reitman, yeah. and, uh, and certainly with Richard Shepard. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't think I've done it with Alexander. I may be wrong. <laughs> um, so, after, uh, since Sideways, after Sideways, he went on into two other films that you weren't a part of. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, so this is the first time that you've worked on, with him since, I think, Sideways? Well, we certainly chatted about both yeah. films. Before, uh, you know, we, we, you know, one of them needed to be... Uh, purely Hawaiian music and uh, but we talked about it for a while and, right. and, and discussed possibilities and uh, um, and Nebraska uh, he fell in love with this particular sound and and why why get me to try and fake it when yeah. he could use the sound himself absolutely so but that's interesting so he wasn't just like leaving you and he just he talked to you about that oh you? absolutely yeah 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 so, wow. um, so you have a, also an amazing collaboration with uh, director Mark Waters, which, mm -hmm. um, I mean, Freaky Friday, House of Yes, Mean Girls, The Ghosts of Girlfriends Past, Mr. Popper's Penguins, Magic Camp coming up. Um, his films kind of veer in more of the character-based, family-friendly rom-com. Rom uh, do you have a certain approach for those kind of toned films that are more, kind of more funny? And more... House of Yes isn't a rom-com. Oh, no, yeah, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> it's not... <laughs> But like in terms of the I mean, yeah, the other films, uh, let's talk about let's focus on genre a little bit. When you when you're working in a rom com or a comedy in general, what makes a successful score in in that genre? Oh, I don't care. I mean, you know, it's 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 just I, I, the genre doesn't matter to me very much. Oh, really? Okay. It only matters if I'm asked to do something that I have done too many times before. Mm -hmm. In which case, what is important to me is to try and find a new way of doing it. Um, in terms outside of that. I, I don't really I don't really pay attention to you know what the genre is I turn I pay attention to what the narrative is and uh -huh. how we how we make it exciting and page turning you know the it's it's there's this sort of slight need to be unresolved in mm. film music because you want no you don't want to make things too complete because yeah. you want to lead the uh, the audience into the next moment um, that's the same in any kind of storytelling. So, but let's, if you're dealing with a comedic tone, for, I mean, does that affect the way you write music? If you have to move around, whether it's physical comedy, whether it's the comedy comes from the dialogue, how do you navigate that as a composer? Well, I, mean, I think a lot of the films I, I get hired to do are, are Rubik cubes of their yeah, own. They're that like, they, yeah, they're not straight comedies, but, but they have right, dramatic but, elements. But even com often comedies are, you know, they they they're problems to solve. Um, so. I think that's always, I, I enjoy that part of it actually, is trying to figure out how you're going to 
provide the energy and the emotion that the directors asked for without trampling on the things that are already working. And quite often, especially if things are funny, it's very difficult to, it's a difficult challenge. You know, you've got yeah. to try and find ways. Sometimes, sometimes things aren't funny and they should be. And right. then you've got to find ways of setting up uh, timing in the way that it plays such that the the timing has delight and surprise in it. I mean, I love, I, I was listening to some Thomas Newman stuff because his approach to comic timing is really wonderful and it's a completely different approach to mine. And yeah. he does it a, a lot with very, with terrific qualities of rhythm that then get interrupted. Mm. And so you, you, you're motoring along and then suddenly, you know, the, the brake is pulled uh -huh. and it's, it's delightful. I love it. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to... Uh, figure out how to do that but um uh let's take example let's take wedding crashes for an example which is a very popular comedy i mean it has two strong leads that are you know comedians um how did you approach that score particularly uh, i don't i don't know <laughs> i did I, I i kept on writing music until some of it worked <laughs> that's fair enough um how do you deal with uh uh, some of the directors that you work with like to use songs in the films and, and you know needle drops and stuff like that so how, how do you navigate that if you I know like Up in the Air has a lot of I love that score by the way it's like Up in the Air is such a, a beautiful film it's so powerful to me and um, but I haven't used a lot of great songs kind of placed throughout the films how do you navigate that soundscape as a composer when you have to make it fit I, Ivan didn't make the film oh, he produced it oh, he, he produced didn't, it that's uh, right. Jason directed Jason. it yeah. I'm sorry Ivan the right one of the Jason right <laughs> um, so yeah but how did you navigate that yeah that space as a composer you just know whether yeah if uh, ideally you know where the songs are going to go right. so those are spotted before they give, they give you generally the generally yeah and, um, and then you just sort of this, this, uh, the ideal thing is to keep playing back what, what you've got. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've, you've, you do some music, you play it with all the, um, the music that's been cut in and you try and figure out how this is working. Am I in the wrong key for that song which is to hand over or, or stuff like that? But, but generally, I'm quite, I'm quite fine. I, I, what I don't like is when important dramatic moments have a song on them, right. when the song just doesn't deliver. In, in, you know, the thing is that pop songs... We think they're emotional, but they're mostly sort of, I mean, they're, they're radio emotional, which is not the same thing as actually yeah. delivering uh, a heartfelt, strong emotion. And so it's, you know, I, the, I often, the, the, the only argument I ever have about um, the use of songs in films is when there's a dramatic moment which is being under, uh, under supported mm. by um, the use of a song. You, but that's the my, that's my only rationale for arguing about a, a song in a film is is the, uh, for dramatic reasons for storytelling reasons not because I, I I'm I'm perfectly fine about songs in films there've always been songs in films absolutely I've read I've got this book of uh, interviews with um, sort of Waxman and um, I think who else is in it it's 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 a uh, John Barry is in there. Uh, Jerry Goldsmith and uh -huh. a lot of the composers are whining about uh, too many songs. This is re this was a film in, a book in the seventies, and oh, they're wow. whining about too many songs in films. <laughs> so it's not like it's changed. Yeah, uh, it's it's just what it is. Right. Um, have you ever encountered a song in a film where you thought this is this this shouldn't be here? Have you ever kind of made an argument to the director saying you should remove this and let me score it? Has that ever come up? Actually, what happens far more often is. A director will say, "We really like this song, but we can't afford it." <laughs> and, so you... uh, and, and you know, you're already writing all this music. You're just we're just going to throw another one on your on your workload, <laughs> and um, so that happens quite often. Well, let's, yeah, let's talk about temp a little bit. Um, what when someone says the word temp, what is, what kind of emotions does that evoke to you? Oh, I, I I am completely neutral about temp because I never hear it. Really? So the directors you work with don't use temp scores, or do you just not? refuse to listen to the temp score. I, 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 it's, we, we understand each other that I am never going to listen to their temp. Wow, yeah. that is great. <laughs> so, I mean, because obviously they're editing with something, you just... Sure, and they should, because otherwise they'd not leave room for music. But do you ever feel like, um, do you, can you tell, like, I don't know, I kind of put temp, I have this, like, visual metaphor, like, if you put your hand in the snow and you take your hand out, 
you see the shape of your hand there. You knew there was a hand there. Do you, is that the same with music? When they take the music out and you're looking at the scene, can you tell the type of music they were editing no. to? No? It doesn't affect that? Okay. That's interesting. Um, so you did... Uh, another great director you work with is Richard Shepard. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, his films are great. Uh, the Hunting Party and Dom Hemingway, uh, Oxygen, Mercy, Mexico City, The Matador. Um, what kind of what kind of director is Richard? Because I mean, those are his films are definitely a different different style than the rest of the directors you work with. Yeah, he's intense. He yeah. uh, he gets really involved. <laughs> I don't know many directors who love production. Uh, a lot of directors love being in post production. They feel their film is coming together. Right. They can now it's yeah. more controlled. They've done the chaos bit, and now they can do the you know the the the, the art the craft of putting it all together yeah. Richard loves production he <laughs> if, if the chaos of lots of people running around and trying to come up with ideas he's very happy in that situation and um, uh, uh, he's he's a very good director he uh, we have a very good rapport I produced one of his films and um, yeah he's he's very passionate which one, which one did you produce I produced Mercy Mercy yeah and um, yeah, he's uh, he's got a lot of energy. <laughs> I, I don't know anyone who who writes more screenplays or put, or makes more more projects than he does. I mean, he goes to he he just happens to be in Japan for um, for for a for a few a couple of weeks, uh, not involved in a production that his. Uh, partner is involved in and then thinks why am I in Japan not making something and suddenly he <laughs> makes Tokyo Project which is this gorgeous short right, film yeah. unlike anything he's ever made he approaches me and, and uh, says do the music and I went well alright and uh, <laughs> um, and it was unlike anything I'd written for him uh, wow. very, very kind of unlike anything I've written actually uh, so um, yeah he's, he's terrific a lot of he's he's, he's bending my arm right now trying to get me to write some cello pieces oh wow <laughs> yeah when you're working with a director that you've established a working uh, relationship with um and you kind of expect that he's give you a phone call on his next film uh, when do you like to start your process like do you i mean does it change every film do you like to read the script first do you like to wait till there's a first cut i mean I, I always like to w watch a film yeah because you can't define anything. I mean, like it, the, the you can't plot solutions to problems which you haven't seen, mm. and a film is full of, you know, problems and and yeah. and the the desire for solutions, and so a script isn't going to give you anything. And on top of which, the photography changes the kind of way way you can score it. You can't do a big epic score for something which is shot entirely intimately right and you don't necessarily know what that's going to be like when you look at a script so uh, you, i have to look at a cut um do you do you, so you just you never read do you read the script at all oh or, sure yeah but it, it doesn't start your creative process at all no no um you've also worked with a few directors that were kind of one-offs but also great scores that uh, you work with grant Heslov for um uh men who stare at, men goats. Who stare at goats which is such a great movie and just a great score um and you work with, of course, Jason Bateman on uh, words. And Grant and, and Jason both come from acting. And is it different? Did you notice any difference working with the directors that kind of have an acting background? Did they work differently? Did they treat music differently? Or was it, does it no. not? No, just the same. <laughs> um, well, talk about the approach for, for Bad Words, because I, I thought it was another great score. Um, and it was... Uh, Again, it was like tone, it was kind of a comedy, but it, the tone of the music was completely. I don't know. It was very interesting. Did you? How do you approach that score? And what was the kind of the, the goals for that one? Very early on, before they shot anything, Jason talked about wanting clarinet in the score, and I thought, well, why don't we do it all all with woodwind? Why don't we do a, a, a totally woodwind score? And in the end, we it's mostly a woodwind score. It's woodwind and percussion. And there are little, I think there's probably some strings in there sometimes, but essentially it's, it's a lot of woodwind. And I thought it'd just be interesting, uh, a good exercise for me to, to, to work that way. Uh, I knew that the uh, a woodwind ensemble is an enormously rich and textured and nuanced thing. Um, so I had no doubt that I could 
get what I needed out of it. So uh, that's that. The, and and also because woodwind has so much character because it's you know you have those very individual instruments. I mean, I, I love the bassoon. I've used the bassoon mm -hmm. a lot in films, and, um, and then of course oboe. I mean, I think bassoon and oboe are probably my, my uh, favorites in the classical orchestra. Well, a flute, of course, you use more, yeah. but it's, uh, and it's a beautiful, lyrical, romantic instrument. But uh, the, for, for, pers for a strange personality, those reeds, the oboe and the bassoon, have uh, that in spades. So uh, the idea of using all woodwind seemed like a great idea. And um, yeah, that was the, the original approach. And Jason came in saying, you know, you, you know better than I, I've never done this before. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that will, ex that will last exactly one week. And then you'll start going, no, that's not right. This needs to be over here. <laughs> and you need to be there. And this is too loud. And this is, a and um, because, because I, I could see that he was a real director. Yeah. And there was no doubt about, about it. And, and that his confidence and a sure, uh, you know, sense of, but also, I mean, I'm. I wanted to be very. I wanted to be accommodating to directors. Yeah. I want them to feel comfortable uh, saying whatever they really feel because I don't want to find down the line mm. that they've been polite about something they hated. Yeah. And now it's going to come. And mess with everything. Uh, mess, yeah. yeah. And then I have to change everything in the entire score because I kept one thing which they never liked. <laughs> so um, I really want my directors to be really comfortable straight mm. up so that they can say, "I do not like that," and you get. It's gone. Let's move on. <laughs> um, yeah, but what are some other traits that you like in, in directors besides having I mean, confident vision? Um, do you like directors more hands-on kind of micromanaging or do you like kind of the freedom to go do your work and, and come back? I mean, how much of direction are you looking for as a composer? I'm, I'm looking for narrative direction, for storytelling. Uh -huh. if, if, if we're not telling the story in the best possible way, I want to know about that. But yeah. I, I don't need you telling me that uh, I, I don't like C-sharp. Why is that instrument playing yeah, that yeah. note? <laughs> um, if, it's, if it's truly an offense to the ear, absolutely. But I, uh, micromanaging is not yeah. um, conducive to great creative flow and, and creative ideas. So it's, it's best to frame the ideas in terms of narrative, in terms of energy, and then I mean, certain directors absolutely do that. They don't care how you get there. Mm. They tell you what there looks like. And if I say, you know, I want to do it all with a Chinese opera uh -huh. orchestra, <laughs> and they, 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 certain directors will say, if you can get where I want you to go with those instruments, that's fine by me. Yeah. And um, so I, I like that because I can set myself interesting sort of uh, challenges and uh, find interesting languages to use. As, but it has to, of course, accord with the language that we, you know, the universal understanding of what music right. and emotion and energy is. Do you like to experiment and try to find new? It seems like you really like to find different routes to get to... to... But I get bored easily. Yeah. So, you know, when I did Rain Over Me, it was going to be another... It, it's, at, at first, it sounded like it was going to be another sort of yeah. pizzicata thon and uh, <laughs> lots of... Clunk, 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 clunk. And I went, no, let's not do that. Let's do, let's do reggae and see if reggae can be funny. Uh -huh. uh, or it's not real reggae, but I mean it's a reggae approach, because uh, I think that offbeat thing is interesting. Yeah. So that's what we did, and it sounded great. Wow! So it's nice to discover a different language for doing the same job. Yeah, I mean, do you have a certain, I guess, region around the world where the music really speaks to you, like in terms of like melody or like whether it's. Well, I, I really like uh, South American classical music. Mm. That always seems, of, of all the different versions of orchestral music, yeah. there's a life and an energy and a rhythmic quality to South American classical or orchestral music that uh, very comfortable fit with me, yeah. Have you incorporated that into any of your scores? Oh, sh sure. I'm sure I have in bits. In <laughs> fact, if you think about it, I think a lot of the Western, great Western scores were infused right. with that. Yeah, absolutely. Bit, from the Magnificent Seven and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that is, yeah. that's, a, that's a Latin orchestral sound. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, 
another director that you worked with. I know I'm focusing on a lot of the directors you work with, but uh, you work with Paul Greengrass on one film, right? No. No? That was The Theory of Flight? That wasn't on? Uh, I did work on The Theory of Flight, but Paul Greengrass was not involved at the point I worked on it. Oh, okay. So that was, you didn't get to interact, because I've no. heard that he's a very strict director with music. <laughs> um, but kind of looking at the industry as a whole from when you started your career into now, how have things changed uh, for the better and how have things changed for the worse? Have you noticed any trends that you, like, this is amazing for the film industry and other things, like, I wish this would be different? Uh, in terms of the film industry? Yeah, I was just working in the film industry, the music industry, kind of where you're working in your space, in your career. Um... I have this idea that there was a time when I worked I unlocked pictures and then that stopped being the case and I was always working on an unlocked picture. But so that just means that when when the technology became faster for mm -hmm. editing they wanted everything quicker right. and that included the music and so it used to be that I would get a locked picture meaning the they stopped editing and yeah. the music could be written to fit and I wouldn't have to spend half my life trying to catch up with a different version of the film different picture we, of it, yeah. right but uh most of the time now they involve me about halfway through the edit which means that the picture is going to change a lot and that ends up being uh weeks of re-editing music that was already written to yeah. fit the new picture so that was that's boring i mean it just yeah. it just it's just burdensome um I'm fascinated in the sort of curvature of uh, and the, the sort of plotting the lines of what happens in scoring music because I know I remember hearing that when Star Wars first came out, 1977, the synth score had been dominant up to uh, for, for becoming more and more dominant, and the the right. symphonic score was disappearing, and then Star Wars comes out and symphonic scoring had a huge boost, yeah. and suddenly everyone wanted that big sound again. And today I feel like we're in a similar sort of position where there's still big orchestral scoring going on, but there's an awful lot of uh, synth or synth-like work mm -hmm. going on. And, um, but I think there's always been a lot of generic film music, and mm -hmm. I don't know if this era is really any different to any other, but I, I look forward to sort of turning a corner and getting melody back yeah, into the forefront. For sure. And, um, and and getting away from a somewhat corporate approach to film music. Yeah. I, mean, I know earlier when we were chatting, you mentioned uh, talking to Alan Silvestri. Yeah. And he is, you know, that that is an author composer. It's yeah, a person amazing. who brings in melody and intelligence and nuance and sophistication and the big orchestral yeah. sound when it's needed. Um, I, I, I think I, I, I have a, an affinity with that approach. And there aren't. I don't think there are a lot of people doing that. There's a lot of people doing you know, the 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 um, something which is less. Just not not. I, I don't think the the interesting stuff is very much in the fore at the moment. Absolutely. I, I I'm. But we there is kind of a surge now of film music concerts where we're seeing kind of. I've noticed the trend where a lot of older scores are getting kind of put into the concert form and and. People are coming in droves. I mean, right. see it. I mean, I think that's a good sign of, of film music. I don't know, still staying really relevant. So I think yeah. it bodes well for the future. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, are, there, are there any kind of uh, do you set goals? I guess creative goals for yourself as a composer. I mean, are you saying oh, I haven't done a, I haven't done a Star Wars type film, or I haven't done a video game, or something like that? Is there something that you haven't tackled yet that you really want to tackle, or you just kind of just see what kind of shows up from the people that you work with in terms of genre of film i, I mean the yes i do do that to a certain degree mm -hmm. and then i look at what the situation would it might actually be if i was to get hired on that <laughs> and quite often i just go yeah maybe not <laughs> it's one thing to be but it's simply because you know if i were got hired to do well I've, I've talked about this before i would love to do an action film yeah action films currently do not want personality in the score right I cannot write music which does not have personality. Consequently, I understand that I am the wrong person to hire until <laughs> that changes. Until right. someone goes, I really like a character 
in this action score. Really, sent a one a strong sense of personality. I mean, John Barry did all these action scores. Yeah, there was no hiding. It's not that he was quirky or anything. He just had a, a his personality in his music was yeah. very evident. Yeah, and right now, that's not really what people are looking for in their action music. So, I would love to do an action film when they are ready to have. A, you know, a, a, a sense of a sense of the better. composer in there, yeah. rather than just a lot of speed. Yeah, because I grew up. I mean, I'm see, I'm not a composer. I grew up. I fell in, fell in love with film through film music. But I grew up. I was born in '87. Grew up in the '90s, which that was like the Bruckheimer action era, where mm -hmm. I mean, those were the most bombastic action scores of all of all time. But like, yeah, I mean, action scores today they don't. I don't know, you don't carry whatever, anything out of the theater with you, I feel. Right. Yeah, and I think that's something that's missing. And I'm, I, I want to carry movies home with me and, like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which I don't see much on. Well, your scores, I do. <laughs> um, so kind of to uh, kind of wrap things up, I always like to ask composers, where does the first note come from? Like, what is the first... I mean, I'm sure it's going to be different on each project, but do you look at a certain area to kind of get that first spark of, of creativity? Are you looking at a, the main character? Are you looking just kind of at the scenery? I mean, it's just different in every every film. The I mean, I essentially, I'm trying to figure out what is the what is a. I like to write a theme that is going to come. We're going to be able to come back to. Mm. Actually, talking about Alan Silvestri, you know, I, I I remember hearing him talking about his theme to Forrest Gump. Yeah, and then realizing after he wrote it for the beginning that he didn't he couldn't put it anywhere else the in the film he kept right, on yeah, trying it and it wouldn't fit <laughs> and then he ended up using it at the end and it fit it fit the end but it did it, yeah. and it's the theme I, you know it, it's one of the themes i remember most from that film yeah. it occurs twice at the beginning and at the end that's true um that would be and i've completely i'm i'm on board with him and that approach you write a theme you go this represents a personality in the film mm -hmm. let's try let's try and capture that personality and see if that makes sense in numerous places right and ideally it does ideally you come up with a a uh, a theme that is going to do is going to be relevant to the narrative and help sort of hold the narrative together and lead us lead us as a an audience along so it could be anywhere in the film but um i would generally after watching the film, find a place with, with enough real estate, you know, mm. that there's a queue that is, you know, a minute and a half or longer that I can get my teeth into. Yeah. And then I will work on that. And um, and then, I, then I'll at least, if it works, I will then have a proper theme, which is long enough to develop and have a second part. And then I can mm. borrow from that to work on other parts of the film. Is the, is theme kind of the first thing that you try to find? Is it a thematic center? Yeah, absolutely. Center? That's the first thing. That's great. Um, I did want to ask, uh, you were talking about how picture edits and, and stuff change, and I I just spent uh, two nights with uh, Dominic Lewis, he's a great guy, he's working on a movie right now, and he, I was documenting his process as the new picture changes were coming in, and how do you, as a composer, keep the score? I, because when one little thing changes, it, it, the ripple effect is insane throughout the rest of the score. How do you keep your score from collapsing if something like, change some, a change like that happens is there like a I can't think of a change like that that would actually I can't think of a change like that that, that would, that would be that, 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 that big of an effect yeah I mean if 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 they took out a character right that would be a big one or decided that the good guy is actually the bad guy and can you now rescore that would be big yeah but otherwise, I've never had a thing. I don't can't think of a thing where, like, is it Jenga? What's the game, game where you Jenga? Yeah, Jenga, yeah. Jenga. Yeah. I can't think of one where, where a situation quite like that where, where it just you, collapses everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's <no>. good. <laughs> um, but Rolf, I want to thank you so much for your time this evening. It was so great to get into your head and your process and and just a huge fan of your of your Get story. out of my head, man! <laughs> Stop getting in my head. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>